Welcome back everyone on this beautiful Sunday morning to watch yet another session of our Dental Reach series on deprogrammers using what we have. Dental Reach is a professional site and forum for dentists. It's a place to be visible as a dental practitioner and get reliable information on dental education. And thousands of dentists use Dental Reach to find reliable information just like you all are here to up your dental game today. I'm Dr. Urvishi and I'll be your host and host for the session while we venture into the third part of Smile Rehabilitation Strategies with none other than Dr. Deepa Ravi Chandran. In today's session, we will closely dissect how we can overcome patient compliance with respect to an extra appliance and yet deprogram them. Not to mention, do away with the added cost of that extra appliance which often is a source of friction between us and the patient. This will be dealt with the one and only talented Dr. Deepa Ravi Chandran, who is a prosthodontist in Navi Mumbai, where she has a successful private practice under the helm of Dental Park. She has won awards at both state and national level in her master's program for both paper as well as poster presentations. She has many publications in index journals, guidance, family, to name a few. Presently, she is a brand ambassador and moderator of Dental Reach the recipient of GOMA Awards for 2021 and 2022, recipient of Doctor's Choice Awards, national and city winner 2021, mentor for the Pulp Tank Activa Pronto Challenge, silver winner in the Dental Divas Indo Resto Contest 2021, and also a contributing author in How to Conquer Dental School, a one-of-a-kind novel giving young undergraduates a unique perspective in navigating the maze that is dental school. Her forte lies in full mouth rehabilitation, smile designing, and restoring cases of complex inclusion conservatively. She has received acknowledgement for the same from peers and patients alike. Over to you, Dr. Deepa, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Dr. Urbashi. And without wasting much time, I'm going to straight away go in with our presentation for today. So the topic has already been shared in advance. Now, um, it's a little difficult. I understand that. I mean, most things in Prosto are difficult. But my aim with this clinical series has always been to um, simplify everything as much as possible. Is my screen visible? Doctor, we can see. So um, we are aware that deprogramming is a concept in dentistry. But how many of us are capable of using what we already have when it comes to deep programming. Now, let me explain this concept because it's a very important concept. It's, it's as important as understanding the concept of deep programming on its own. So um, when a patient comes to us in our practice, okay, um, we end up having to use deep programmers and it's not as rare as we think. It does happen quite often. So traditionally, the programmers are appliances, an extra appliance which we give the patient, for which patients are billed for in most practices. And this does add a burden of an added extra cost to the patient. Because let's face it, prosthetic treatment options are not cheap. And um, the other issue with the deprogramming appliance is that there are patients who are non-compliant. Uh, they are not comfortable wearing it or they do not want to wear it. So what happens is this leads to a stalemate situation between the clinician and the patient, uh, where the clinician refuses to proceed ahead with the treatment because the patient is not getting deprogrammed or the patient is not wearing the appliance. And the patient is not proceeding with the treatment because the clinician is insisting that the patient has to wear said appliance or has to, you know, be billed extra for said appliance. So this causes a lot of friction sometimes. And then the case does not get converted, um, which in a situation like this doesn't really benefit anyone, neither the, neither the clinician nor the patient. So to overcome this issue, what I do in my practice is I use something which is already a part of the treatment. And I know that this sounds very strange because uh, 
when we talk about deprogrammers, the names that pop in our mind are Lucia Jig or the Koi Step Programmer, or uh, you know, they, or you know the one. There are so many deprogrammers these days by so many different companies, and all deprogrammers are variations of an anterior bite plate, basically. So these day programmers are essentially nothing but an anterior bite plane, both either in the maxillary arch or in the mandibular arch. But as I said, they are an extra appliance which require fabrication by a lab for which the patient is billed for in, in most practices. So instead of going down this traditional route, if we could use something that is already a part of the treatment plan, okay, something um, which if fixed is even better, not something which is removable and you do not need to build the patient additionally. That overcomes a lot of the issues that I've mentioned earlier. So Dr. Rudvishi, could we have that first poll? You know the one I'm talking about, right? Yeah, actually I already pulled it up uh, where the question was, uh, are these programmers needed for every single case of malocclusion? And 100% have answered no. Okay. And uh, what about the second poll? Uh, you know, it, I, I want to put it up now. Yeah, yeah. I want to know where the audience stands and how many how many have explored this route, or do people only use the the, the traditional uh, deprogramming appliance? Okay, adding it right now. Yeah. And do let me know the results. So. Um, I, I have actually discussed, I have actually already discussed one case of such deprogramming in the last webinar. Uh, it, if you recollect, it was the case of smile rehab, um, where I had, uh, you know, the patient did not get deprogrammed and I did have to, had to use an additional appliance. And in that case, I used a soft split, but these cases are typically rare in most of my cases. Uh, I do not need to give an additional appliance once the treatment has completed and they remain deep programs. But there are those rare occasions. So in case you have missed the previous webinar, you do not know what I'm talking about. There is an article on deep programming which is available on the Dental Reach website. We will be putting up the link later on or you can reach out to any one of us and we will share the link. And in that article, I have mentioned the, the case that, that I spoke about extensively in the previous webinar along with the case in today's webinar and a short excerpt of the case that we are going to see in the next webinar, which is an FMR case where I have once again deprogrammed the patient on similar principles and guidelines as what I'm using today. So Dr. Urvashi, is the poll result ready? The poll results are ready and the audience seems quite divided because uh, they have opted for both the options 50-50% where using a separate Separate appliance, and some are saying that they already use something part of the case. So uh, okay, okay. So, so I, uh, now I, the poll results have changed. Uh, okay. There are like uh, a greater percentage where sixty-six percent of the audience says that they use something which is already part of the case, while thirty-three percent uh, say that they use a separate plan. Okay, so now for all those of you who have answered that you use something which is already a part of the case, I encourage you all to please share it in the chat box. I, I really want to know what it is that you guys are using, which is a part of this case. And then we can have a good discussion on this at the end of the webinar. And Dr. Urvish, if you can just make a note of it and let me know at the end. Sure, sure thing, doctor. Okay, so now moving on with the case at present. Um, see, I had this um, lady who was in her late 20s who approached my operatory and she complained of very severe pain in 4-6. And uh, she had an FPD, which, which was from 4-5, and 4-7. But the FPD was fractured on 4-7. Now, whenever we get an FPD which has fractured, okay, we have to have the first point in mind, which is something went wrong with the occlusion. Of course, there could have been something wrong, um, you know, with the with the manufacturing of the FPD also. I'm not denying that. It does happen, okay, because um, if the lab was not reputed or if uh, there was too much of chair side trimming and the metal had weakened and it fractured, yes, that is possible. Yes, I, I don't deny that. But those situations are few and far between. Most of the time, it is because 
the SPD had been fabricated in the wrong bite. And when an SPD is fabricated in the wrong bite, it ends up fracturing. So now the next question that would be on anybody's mind would be is um, uh, how is it possible for a patient to have an SPD fabricated in the wrong bite in her mouth for five years and not be uncomfortable at all? Which is a very valid question because, uh, you know, uh, our patients really cannot tolerate even a single small high point. They feel so uncomfortable. They come back and they say, no, we, we, I cannot eat. I'm not able to eat from one side. And I'm feeling that it's high. So how is it possible to have an FPD which was fabricated completely wrong and the patient be comfortable for five years? So this situation is a little unique. It's not something that you're going to see in every single case. And that's also one of the reasons why to identify such a case becomes very difficult. Okay. Um, the FPD was not fabricated high. When I say the wrong bite, I mean the, the wrong position of maximum intercuspation. The FPD did not have high points. In fact, it was completely flat. The issue was that it had been fabricated in the wrong MIP. And when you see clinical pictures ahead, you realize um, as to how that error took place. I would not completely blame the operator in this uh, situation because as I said, um, it's a very unique situation and very difficult to identify and diagnose. So, you know, these errors, they do happen. So that's one thing. And when you see the patient's occlusion, you would understand why the patient was not uncomfortable for five years with it and why the patient was able to manage. And, you know, she was quite happy with it and she was able to chew with it for five years. Still, she started getting pain. And the pain was because uh, of this DK over here on 4-7. So 4-7 was endodontically treated and that, that, that's not something I want to get into in today's webinar. The focus on today's webinar is the prosthetic option. But yes, it was endodontically treated for the record. And that was not the difficult part. The difficult part was how, how you know, there are two parts to this. If, if the FPD was fabricated at the wrong bite, what is the correct bite? That is the first question. And the second question over here is if after being uh, 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 you know, being given an FPD in the wrong MIP for five years, would the patient now be able to transition to an FPD in the correct MIP? That's the second. That's the second uh, thing that we need to think about in such cases. So uh, it's never that simple. So now, whenever whenever we have a case like this in our practice and we suspect that the previous prosthesis has been fabricated in the wrong MIP, there is no point in trying to assess the patient's MIP till the prosthesis is removed from the mouth. So when I removed the um, the apply uh, the FPD from her mouth, this is her true uh, MIP, and um, the patient required some manual guidance before she was able to occlude in this position. I will admit to that. It's not as simple as uh, telling the patient, okay, please close or please bite, and the patient is just going to give us the correct bite accurately. No, it's not like that in such cases. Uh, the patient is going to have a tendency to bite in the habitual MIP as opposed to the true MIP. So some amount of mandibular guidance will be required in such cases. So now this is the frontal view. And you can very clearly see that this is a case of uh, edge to edge bite in the anteriors. Please also note this attrition of the anteriors on the incisal edge of the anteriors over here okay the other thing is i do not have previous cas previous or any type of intraoral uh, documentation or photographs so i have no idea what the patient's previous mib was so these type of cases require a lot of experience and a lot of patience um there are two results we may or may not be able to, uh, you know, ultimately um, detect or come to the knowledge of what the patient's true MIP was prior to five years. We may or we may not, because see, five years is a very, very long period of time. And, uh, you know, the muscles and the entire TMJ apparatus, they get programmed to a certain bite. 
they get programmed to a certain MIP, which is what we call as the habitual MIP. And after five years, even if we do manage to locate the true MIP, the patient may or may not be comfortable going back to that original true MIP because too long a period of time has passed. So this is something we need to keep in our mind and be mentally prepared for. Now, if this happens, where we are able to locate the true MIP, but the patient is not completely comfortable there, we have to then find a mid ground, okay, a midway between the true MIP and the habitual MIP. So that's something I will discuss in a little more detail as this webinar progresses. The second option is we are not able to locate the original true MIP. What I mean by the original true MIP is what the patient had five years ago or 10 years ago or before the patient came to us. Okay. Um, whenever I talk about uh, locating the true MIP, it's always a question mark in such cases, because as I said, we don't have any records. We absolutely do not have any records to prove that the MIP that we or I have located now at present is or was the patient's true MIP as it originally existed. So we cannot simply say, you know, this is how it is. Yes, it could be, but it may or may not be also. So this is something that we really need to keep in our mind. Yes, it's complicated. I understand that. But that's how prosthetic principles are. That's how the principles of occlusion are. It isn't that simple. It's not a simple two plus two equal to four. There are so many permutations and combinations that it's very difficult to analyze a case chair side. So this is one of the reasons I try to make the workflow as simple as possible because I do not believe in overly complicating cases. It's tough as it is. So, so my approach has been to simplify as much as possible wherever possible. So for all purposes, I this was the MIP that I could locate at that point chair side, okay, which I believe to be her true MIP. This is definitely not her habitual MIP, but to differentiate between the two, I'm going to call this as the true MIP and I'm going to call the MIP that she had earlier with the prosthesis as her habitual MIP. So am I clear till here? Are there any questions before I proceed ahead? If there are, please ask them in the chat box. I prefer to answer the questions then and there rather than come to it right at the end. If there are any questions, Dr. Urvashi, please let me know. Sure thing, doctor. As of now, there are no questions. Okay. Watch. okay. So now, this image shows us the true MIP of the patient. And this is a left and right view. Now, if you see, there is a very slight overjet. Very, very, very slight. The overbite is almost non-existent. And the overjet is almost just about 0.5 mm. That's it. So when we talk about, I have spoken about the ideal overjet and overbite in the last two webinars extensively. I've always said that the ideal overjet and overbite is supposed to be 2 mm because that is what gives us the ideal amount of anterior guidance, a steep anterior guidance so that the um, posteriors are disoccluded when the incisal edges of the upper and the lower anteriors assume a position of um, uh, MPO, okay, which is mutually protected occlusion. But when you see a case like this, where the overjet is just 0.5 mm, the overbite is non-existent. And to add to it, you see this type of attrition on the incisal edges. It's very, very clear that the anterior guidance is almost non-existent in such a case. And definitely there has been encroachment on the anterior guidance. So only when the anterior guidance gets encroached upon, does this attrition start to appear on the incisal edges. So this is something that one has to take a little seriously, okay? I'm not saying immediately we go in for an FMR. Not every patient who comes to us with attrition in the anteriors is, a, is, a, is an FMR case on the spot. But there could be potential of future FMR cases and it doesn't hurt to make a note and it doesn't hurt to just let the patient know that there's something wrong with their bite and that is the reason why this is happening, okay? It sets the stage for the future FMR consultation. And... Uh, See, these, these type of cases, okay, it is skeletal. It is not entirely dental. So that makes it more difficult, 
uh, even because when it is skeletal malocclusion, even if you were to do an FMR, you cannot achieve an ideal, you probably cannot achieve an ideal class one with an ideal two mm overjet and overbite. It's probably not going to be possible. So there are limitations even to an FMR. Okay. So these are all the things we need to keep in our mind. So sometimes, you know, it's better to postpone that FMR for as long as is possible, considering all of this. So this, as you can see over here, this should have been her true MIP. This is based on the, uh, the guidance of the mandible chair side, manual guidance, as well as my experience, as well as, uh, you know, various other uh, 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 tactics that we use to get the patient's musculature to relax chair side so that the condyles are able to seat completely and we are trying to attempt a retruded position. One thing I want to clarify over here, why am I using the term MIP and not centric relation? The reason is because we are dealing with a dentate patient over here. In a dentate patient, the position of maximum intercuspation is different from the position of centric relation. Whereas both are made to coincide in an edentulous patient, um, especially those with uh, removable dentures, because uh, it is not possible to achieve stability of the lower denture. So that is the reason why we try to make the centric relation and the position of mass maximum intercuspation coincide in those with complete dentures. But in a dentate individual, the two never coincide. Now the next question if the two never coincide does it mean that every every single patient has some form of malocclusion no that's not true see the thing is our tmj apparatus is very unique and it can adapt to a variety of situations variety of malocclusions provided it's all within 25 microns anything beyond that it cannot adapt and when it doesn't adapt it shows that not adaptation in two ways Okay. The first way is the patient comes with pain, pain in the muscles of mastication, pain in the masseter, pain in the temporomandibular joint area, pain radiating all the way from the joint or uh, down to the jaw, sometimes the lower jaw, that is the chin, and sometimes it can even radiate up to the temples. So those cases are a little easier to identify. I will not say that they're easy to treat. I'm saying they're easier to identify because a patient comes with obvious orofacial pain and uh, we we see a very bad bite we see we probably see a collapsed bite intraorally or or we see a complete lack of curve of speed in the mouth so it's easier to identify such patients but then to be very honest i'm not saying patients do not come with pain they do but the percentage of patients who land up in our practice without pain even though they have a bad bite is more. I'm sure that a lot of you would agree with me on this. A lot of us have patients where there is obviously something seriously wrong with their bite, but the patient refuses to go ahead with any type of rehabilitative treatment simply because the patient doesn't have any pain. So why is that? So why is it that there is a percentage of patients who have or experience pain in the temporomandibular joint and the surrounding apparatus, and there is a percentage of patients who do not experience that pain even though they both have the wrong bite. The reason is because the in the second category, uh, the lack of pain is offset by the damage which is done to the teeth. So that's what happens. The patient may not experience pain, but it is, um, it is at the cost of the teeth intraorally. So you see this attrition, you see abrasion, you see their facets. So it's a cycle. So it's not just a cycle. It's actually... It's actually a stage-wise progression. So initially, you know, the pain actually is the last, uh, you know, it's the last thing that we see chair side. It, it's not something uh, that we are going to see right at the beginning. In fact, the pain is right at the end, okay, which is when the patient actually seeks dental treatment of any sort. It starts off with attrition, abrasion, bare facets, which progress from minor ones to more severe ones, Eventually, the attrition or the abrasion becomes severe enough to cause the posterior VD to collapse. And there is a loss of vertical dimension. Uh, the occlusal surfaces become completely flat. So there is a loss of all the enamel and half of the dentine. That's when the teeth now become sensitive. And eventually, 
the TMJ pain sets in. So what we are seeing over here is probably the beginning. And in the beginning, there are patients who do not have pain. And the ones who come to us with pain have already reached the end of the road, so to speak. So that is one thing that I wanted to mention. Now, there are patients who do, who do not have the wrong bite. Their bite is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. They do not have any severe malocclusion. And yet, their position of maximum intercuspation does not coincide with their centric relation. It's actually entirely correct. That's how it is with dentate patients. But... Um, a patient is supposed to have a slide. The patient is supposed to be able to slide without any interference from the position of centric relation to the position of maximum intercuspation. Okay. This is called as long centric or slide in centric. So as long as patients have this long centric or slide in centric and they're able to move with ease from centric relation to MIP and back and forth. Also from MIP to, to uh, the position of lateral excursions in the chewing pattern, the patient will be fine. There wouldn't be any pain in the TMJ. Neither are we going to see any loss of uh, tooth substance intraorally in the mouth. These issues start when there are occlusal interferences which do not allow this smooth slide in centric or long centric to take place. So now obviously if you see this patient, uh, if you see this occlusal scheme posteriorly, she already has another uh, another uh, crown over here. There is, it's almost flat. There is no curve of speed here. Here it's a reverse curve of speed on this side, okay? So the curve goes something like this, okay? It goes here and then it goes in reverse over here down. So it's like this and then it's like this. So when you have uh, something like this, definitely there are occlusal interferences from the position of centric relation to the position of maximum intercuspation. Added to that, the patient was given a prosthesis um, in, 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 an, in, the, in the wrong MIP to which the patient got habituated. So that is what is going to show up as uh, tooth wear on the incisal edges. Now, I am fairly certain that this attrition that we see here has developed in the last five years and not before. Because if the patient had this attrition earlier, before the FPD was fabricated, it would not be this minor. It would actually be a lot worse than what we are seeing. Uh, so if it is minor or if it has just started out, I mean, this loss must be about 0.5 mm, definitely less than 1 mm. So this is something fairly recent. So this is something that we see in the last five years. So this is the reason why I attribute this attrition to have taken place after the old PFM had been fabricated. So something that has taken place in the last five years, okay? And does the anterior guidance make a difference? Yes, it makes a lot of difference. As I have mentioned in the last two webinars, I mean, uh, those who attended would know in both Spine Rehab 1 and Spine Rehab 2 have spoken extensively on anterior guidance. And the difference between a shallow anterior guidance versus a steep anterior guidance, and they make it makes a lot of difference. So um, the reason why I'm again mentioning anterior guidance over here, I'm not going to go into detail, of course, but I just want you to understand that anterior guidance is very, very important. It's not something that um, comes into play only if it's a case of an anterior rehab or an anterior smile design. And it's not something that you consider, you need to consider if it's just a posterior crown or a posterior three unit bridge. It's not like that. There are certain specific cases where uh, you do and you have to analyze it and take it into consideration. And this is one of them. The first thing, as I said here is, the anterior guidance has been encroached upon, which is why we see this attrition. So now, short of an FMR, I cannot change this anterior guidance over here. I cannot convert, see, a, a 0.5 mm anterior guidance, no, a point, sorry, a 0.5 mm overjet um, with almost a zero degree anterior guidance is almost the same as complete lack of anterior guidance. And I cannot create one out of thin air without converting this case to an FMR. But then as I have mentioned earlier, when you have skeletal case, okay, uh, there are limitations even to the FMR. So even if I were to do an FMR, I'm not very sure if we can achieve an ideal 
uh, class one occlusion with an ideal 2 mm over jet and an ideal 2 mm over bite. So what is the next best thing that I can do? The next best thing I can do is try to preserve this 0.5 mm as much as possible. Agreed, it's barely there. It's hardly there. It's, it's the bare minimum. But something is better than nothing. Even this 0.5 mm can probably go a long way in delaying that FMR. It can probably go a long way in not um, aggravating these symptoms and in not uh, accelerating these symptoms. I'm not saying that the wear may not progress. See, uh, we don't know. You know, in, in these kind of cases, one would have to periodically review and one would have to keep documenting and keep checking up on the documentation. And for me, this patient didn't come back after that. So next time when she comes, I the, the first thing I'm going to do is take intraoral photographs and analyze. But um, even if this attrition, if the progression of this attrition does not stop completely, it will definitely delay. Okay. And that's good enough in such cases. Even if you cannot completely stop it, at least we delay it as much as is possible. So we prolong uh, the FMR stage for several years or as many years as is possible. That is our role as a chair set clinician at this point in time with such patients. Okay, so this is why analyzing the anterior guidance uh, becomes very, very important uh, because our notes, our photographs, they all are very important even at a later date, say 10 years down the line, the patient comes back to us for an FMR. We, sh we, we have the documentation, we have the notes to know where we started and where we are now and what were the changes, were they good, were they bad uh, or did it just plateau out and was it more or less the same. So uh, such cases need to be handled with a complete digital workflow only. So uh, either you scan, if you have an intraoral scanner, you scan, uh, you know, you scan the this, you scan the bite and you send the file to the lab, or else you make upper and lower impressions, and the lab scans the cast in the bite that uh, you have provided that with, and then they send you the exocad file. So you cannot make the ordinary, uh, you know, the lost wax pattern crowns or bridges in such cases. The earlier PFM that the patient had been given was one that had been fabricated on the lost wax pattern. And that's where the errors start setting in. When it is not a CAD workflow, there is a lot of potential for errors. But when it is a CAD workflow, we can minimize such errors. So that is one thing. The reason we need this is because we need to provide complete freedom in excursion for such patients. See, this, these type of patients require more freedom in excursion. What do I mean by freedom in excursion? I mean, there should be no interference. There should be no interference from the position of maximum intercuspation to left and right lateral excursion or from the position of maximum intercuspation to the position of protrusion because this is the chewing cycle of the patient. The chewing cycle of the patient involves movements from the from the position of MIP to left or right lateral or to the protrusive and then and then returning back to the MIP. So there must be sufficient freedom in excursion with no occlusal interferences. The, the case is any which way stuff because um, the distance that the incisal edges of the upper and the lower anteriors have to travel before they come edge to edge or in the position of protrusion is very less. It's only 0.5 mm. So that is another reason why there is adhesion of these incisal edges. So as I said, this is not a case where we can completely prevent it. We cannot prevent it because 0.5 mm is too less. It's too less a distance for the jaw to travel to prevent this type of wear and tear from taking place. So all we can do is um, delay the damage. I mean, slow it down. That's what I mean. All we can do is slow down the amount of damage that is going to take place in, in, in such a case. We cannot eliminate it completely. Okay. So that is, uh, that is why we need a CAD workflow. And when we have a CAD workflow, in such cases, you do need to, um, you know, input the condyla guidance in the case before you fabricate the posterior prosthesis. Now, how, how am I going to input the condyla guidance? Either I need to take a protrusive bite and we set it on the articulator and we figure out what the uh, condyla angulation is for the case. Or the other way out is through experience, 
one would know what angulation to give for a particular case and you inform the technician to input input that condyla guidance um, uh, into the workflow. So, you know, patients typically have a condyla guidance from 20 degrees to 30 degrees. 30 degrees is considered as a steep condyla guidance and 20 degrees is considered as a shallow condyla guidance. And very few, very, very few individuals have a steep condyla guidance with absolutely no wear and tear in the mouth. There are very few individuals. Most people who have a very steep condyla guidance show some type of wear, wear and tear um, oh, on the heart tissues in the mouth. And um, I have, from what I have seen is uh, those who have a condyla guidance between 20 and 30 degrees, somewhere around 25 degrees, they, it's optimum. You know, there is an optimum balance which is reached as such between the heart tissues and the soft tissues. So the soft tissues here are the TMJ apparatus and the muscles and the heart tissues here are the teeth. And they do not show too much of wear and tear, too much of abrasion uh, to the point where it impacts it impacts their ability to be able to chew or it gives them some, some sort of pain or it gives them some sort of um, negative repercussions. So the other reason why you need to have a CAD workflow is because when we analyze the occlusion in the mouth, there are limitations. We cannot see it three-dimensionally the way we can see it on a CAD. See, on a CAD, I can rotate it. I can actually view it from the posterior. I can also tilt the CAD at these impossible angulations to check um, exactly what type of contact is present. This is something I cannot do chair side uh, intraorally when I'm looking at the occlusion in the patient's mouth. And these things matter a lot. Um, this is more like uh, analyzing the occlusion very minutely. Now, is it needed in every case? No. But it is needed in such cases because why am I going to such lengths? The reason is because I have to figure out the true MIP of the patient and I don't have previous casts or any type of records. And as I said right in the beginning, I'm not sure if what I figured out is actually the true MIP. And I may very well need, need to come to some sort of compromise between what I believe is the true MIP and the patient's habitual MIP simply because the patient is not able to adjust. So this is actually a very huge responsibility that the clinician takes up when doing such cases. You know, it's it, it's not just a simple case of a three unit FPD or it's not just a simple case of even a single crown. These cases are far more complex than uh, what we could actually imagine. So it requires a lot of investment of time, both chair side as well as off chair side because it takes a lot of time to analyze the occlusion like this, then communicate that to the lab. It again takes time for the technician to grasp what it is that we are trying to tell him or her. Then to be able to uh, translate that into the final product. So, you know, then the final product being the final FPD. So you can see that um, it's not that simple. It, it's quite complicated. Now, on her left side, you can see that the intercuspation is not very tight. Okay, there is contact only here. Otherwise, there is a mild open bite over here. Okay. As, as, I, as I said, I'm analyzing the occlusion because I need to figure out what her true MIP was. And here you can clearly see that it's a complete and total reverse curve of speed over here. Now, is I have to give the patient a proposed occlusal scheme that I believe was her true MIP. So uh, we always have to try it out first. You cannot just directly give the patient a proposed occlusal scheme straight away in such cases. Because as I said, we ourselves are not sure, we cannot be 100% sure in the absence of records that yes, this is in fact the patient's true MIP. And even if it is, is the patient going to be able to adapt after so many years? So we need a trial. We cannot straight away give the final prosthesis to the patient in such cases. Even though the patient did not have uh, a tight intercuspation on the left side, I have attempted to give a tight intercuspation here on the right. Will it suit the patient? I don't know. Okay. But... If we talk about uh, the correct concepts of occlusion, then an open bite isn't one of them. 
okay correct concepts of occlusion do talk about an intercuspation uh, tight intercuspation between the upper and the lower teeth in the posteriors that is needed and that is very essential it is needed not only to maintain the position of mip but it is also needed for that posterior disocclusion to take place when the upper and the lower anterior teeth assume an edge to edge position if you do not give this tight intercuspation it affects everything else it affects the disocclusion it affects the chewing pattern it affects a lot of stuff so um will the patient adapt i do not know but we need to keep one thing in mind ultimately a lot of things that we do chair side in such cases center on this one question is the patient adapting because that's your end point that's your end result that that's the reason why you are uh, fabricating an fpd or you're doing the case or you're giving the patient a prosthesis it ultimately all hinges on this so um you may be giving the patient a very ideal occlusion but that has got no value if the patient is unable to adapt so the ideal occlusion may not necessarily be ideal for this case on hand or for the case that you have on hand chair set okay so there are a lot of adaptations or modifications or tweakings that one needs to do a uh, chair side on a case by case basis i e customizing the occlusion for that particular patient's needs and uh, i will be sharing a lot of cases in fact there one of the webinar scheduled is exactly this customizing and troubleshooting uh, uh, cases of occlusion selectively chair side okay so there are a lot of other cases which i will be discussing in the future now what were the modifications that i did to exocat so exocat allows us to twist and turn it 3d and and analyze the occlusion very very minutely and it also helps us to modify in more ways than one because as i said this is not a view that i'm going to be able to get intraorally in the mouth you know i can never see this in the mouth so now if i see the occlusion from the lingual over here once again the intercuspation is not very tight so it wasn't tight neither on the buccal nor on the lingual now you have already seen the intercuspation on the buccal in the previous slide i have tried to give tight intercuspation but i have replicated the uh, lingual occlusion on the opposing side for the right side okay why because i didn't think that the patient's tmj would be able to adapt to tight intercuspation both on the buccal as a, buccal as well as on the lingual now uh, through experience i know that uh, uh, even though i don't have access to her cast or to her records that uh, the patient having such tight intercuspation both on the buccal as well as on the ling lingual um in her two mip is very very rare okay very rare in most cases the occlusion on one side mirrors the other side that's that that's what happens in most cases i'm not saying it happens in all cases there are cases where there are there are subtle differences between the occlusion on the left and the occlusion on the right again um you know that that's that's another in a, another uh, thing that would require detailed analysis because even the subtle differences that that you see was it something that came about due to interferences i e what i mean to say is did those subtle differences get created because of interferences and because of the need of the tmj apparatus and the dentition to adapt to those interferences or were they always pre existing right from day one see now this is an answer that we are never going to get okay so occlusion is very very complex it's more complex in ways that we can even imagine and that's why um you know when it comes to modifications or subtle tweakings there's no right and wrong it all depends on what the patient is able to adapt finally of course the basic tenets or the basic principles of occlusion one have to keep in mind uh, there are no two ways about it but compromise is essential it's essential even in fmr cases because as i mentioned one cannot always do uh, an ideal fmr it's not possible especially in cases of skeletal malocclusion so i gave her tight intercuspation on the buccal but i replicated the intercuspation on the lingual from the opposing side i wanted symmetrical contacts so that it would be a little more comfortable for the patient 
So now this was the test drive. Okay. Now what do I mean by test drive? This is not the final. This is a temporary prosthesis made out of PMMA. Okay. What is PMMA? It's polymethyl acrylate. It's a type of uh, temporary prosthesis, which is actually milled cat cam. So the reason why it's very important to give a PMMA in such cases is because uh, when you have taken the pains to customize the occlusion on the exocad, and it's very difficult, you want to test whether that occlusion can be adapted to by the patient. You cannot give the patient a handmade FP. The technician will never, ever, ever be able to replicate the same modifications and tweakings that were done on the exocad. Um, you know, when they are making the uh, the FPD, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the traditional method, it's just simply impossible. And again, these are the, you know, these are the potential areas where things go wrong. So things go wrong um, on the day of the final prosthesis delivery because things went wrong in the workflow. So if the workflow is done correctly, uh, the day of the delivery of the final prosthesis becomes really, really simple, very, very easy. I always believe in struggling before, but not on the day that I am inserting the final prosthesis in the patient's mouth. Okay. So this is a, a temporary FPD, which has been made CAT CAM based on the occlusal scheme that, that we have, um, uh, you know, um, analyzed and, uh, locked on for that particular patient as uh, the probable uh, true MIP. Okay. Now, the second we inserted the FPD, this was the occlusion that the patient gave. This is her habitual MIP. Because see, you can clearly see that the upper and the lower anteriors are edge to edge. The 0.5 mm of overjet that we had in the earlier slide has vanished. So this actually is the reason why the patient was comfortable in the habitual MIP for five whole years. The lack of anterior guidance. The lack of anterior guidance and the fact that there was only 0.5 mm difference between her true MIP and her habitual MIP. So the difference was so less that the patient was able to adapt. Okay. The patient's TMJ was able to adapt, but it was at the cost of the wear and tear of the anteriors. So it's obvious you need to deprogram the patient. Now, when you have a situation like this, it's very, very obvious that the patient has to be deprogrammed from this habitual MIP to the true MIP or to the MIP that I think is the true MIP. Now, when and how do we deprogram and can we use what we already have, which is the entire premise of today's webinar. Okay. I have in this case used this prosthesis, the PMMA as a deprogrammer. I have not given the patient anything additional. I've not given the patient any, any form of bite play. I'm, uh, no, no form of anterior bite play, neither in the upper or in the lower jaw. I have simply used this temporary FPD to deprogram the patient. Dr. Urvashi, has anybody shared with us what they use chair side? Similar, similar to what I'm speaking on? Not right now, ma'am. Okay. Fine. So now, how have I used the PMMA as a reprogrammer? I have fabricated it in what I thought to in what I have thought is the true MIP. Okay, but the patient is including an habitual MIP. Now, when the PMMA has been fabricated in true MIP, but the patient keeps trying to occlude in habitual MIP, it's going to make it very, very uncomfortable for the patient. Very, very uncomfortable. Okay. Because the shift between the true MIP and the habitual MIP is so subtle. This is her true MIP. And as you can see, there is a complete lack of occlusion. Uh, okay, there is a, sorry, this is her habitual MIP, not her true MIP. There is a complete lack of occlusion in the posteriors over here. This complete... Dr. Dhar, if I may stop now for a moment. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Yeah. Would you like to answer it right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, could you please follow uh, so, the question? Yeah, so Dr. Farad is asking that do we give the try-on to the patient before final insertion? And if yes, then for how many days? Yeah. 
yeah that's a good question yes as i said you need you need a um, you need a trial you have to give a trial prosthesis in such cases now how many days is a very good question okay the fact that you have to give a trial is a no brainer but how many days there is no straight answer for this it depends on how long it takes for the patient to adapt so for some patients it could be a week for some it could be two for some it could be three for some it could be as long as a month a month is usually the longest that it that it takes you know that's one of the reasons why even in fmr cases when deprogramming is done it is done usually for around a month a month is enough a month is the max but that doesn't mean that every patient requires a month patients can get deprogrammed well before a month so that really depends on the patient so i hope i have answered that dr parag and i will i will uh, i will uh, mention how many days it took for this patient because you know that information comes up in the later slide is there any other question dr urvashi as of now i was the question that we had so if there are any okay in the future i'll ask you yeah so as you can see there is complete lack of posterior occlusion because it had been fabricated in through mip and the patient is occluding in habitual mip so of course there's going to be no occlusion in the posterior so this made it very 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 difficult for the patient very difficult for the patient very uncomfortable for the patient okay um now you have two choices as a clinician over here you can either take a chance and see if the patient is able to adjust okay or as i mentioned way earlier in the webinar itself you may need to have a mid ground you may need to adjust your pmma to a mid ground between what you think is a true mip and what is a patient's habitual mip so as to help the tmj adjust because as i said 5 years is a very long period of time and it may not be possible to go you know to go so backward so sometimes you may need to come to a mid ground okay this is a true mip how did i achieve this did the patient occlude on her own in this bite no no the second i put the prosthesis in the mouth the patient had forgotten what her true mip was she was able to occlude in the true mip with a little bit of ma uh, manual manipulation of the mandible only when the prosthesis was not in the mouth but the second i put the prosthesis in her mouth it was the habitual mip that 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 she favored that she preferred that she was more comfortable with even though it was at the cost and the expense of her anterior so uh, now achieving this deprogramming it is a slow multi step process it is not easy it requires a lot of investment chair chair uh, chair time and it does require time for the patient also to adjust okay it is not it's not uh, you know you have to have the empathy for the patient it is it isn't something that the patient can um, you know can adjust to or accommodate to it's like trying to squeeze your feet into a pair of shoes that are slightly on the smaller side i mean we've all been there sometimes even if we buy shoes which are our size they're still too tight and you know the you know you may really like a pair but then the next one is too large and this one is too tight and we end up buying it any which ways because you know you you keep wearing it they're going to expand so it's something like that but the period of time when we are wearing it is really painful we get so many blisters and sore spots and you know it takes it takes like a month a month and a half two three months even to break those shoes in till you are comfortable wearing it for extended long periods of time so it is something very 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 similar what we are seeing here in the in the mouth okay i had to manually manipulate and guide the mandible into this position i had to without that it was not possible for the patient to occlude in this uh, in this position at all it was just not possible for her to to occlude here now what i did over here was um i sent the patient back home in disappointment and i told her just wait and watch see me after 3 4 days let me know let me know how you are doing because i'm not sure if she's going to adapt or not i have no idea we have to wait and watch uh, there is no easy answer to this and the patient got in touch with me uh, after 3 4 days she had a lot of pain a lot and when i say pain i don't mean pain here no pain here the pain was not in the tooth the pain was in the musculature a lot of pain in the musculature and that is obvious 
because we are forcing her TMG to adapt to a completely new position of MIP. And that adaptation is coming with a lot of pain in the musculature. So now you need to take a call. You need to judge. You know, she, she needed enzoflam. It was that bad. I had to give her enzoflam, which is the mildest, you know, among, uh, you know, uh, uh, among uh, any sort of, you know, uh, muscle relaxants. I didn't want to give, you know, I wouldn't even call enzoflam a muscle relaxant. It isn't. We all know that. But the ceratopeptidase helps in, in, the, in the inflammation. I didn't want to put her on very strong muscle relaxants. I, I, you know, I wasn't very comfortable doing that because they have a very long, long, uh, you know, long effect. Okay, their uh, plasma life is very long. So when you put, sometimes when you put patients on long acting skeletal muscle relaxants, they get very used and habituated to the long acting skeletal muscle relaxants and they would rather choose that than, um, you know, the hard way of uh, getting the TMG actually adapted in the absence of all these crutches. So I, I asked the patient to only use Enzoplam on an SOS basis. So when she came back, uh, to the, Dr. Deepa, if I may stop you again, there is another yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, where they've yeah. asked that does orthodontic correction help? No, not in this case because it is skeletal. Okay. And there is also another question where uh, where the individual is asking that if they can do FMR cases on their own at their clinic. Okay, this is very subjective. Um, that would really depend upon the clinician skill. I mean, if you have the skill, go ahead. But if you do not, uh, please call someone, a consultant who has the skill because it's more important to do the case right. See, this is what I personally believe in. Okay. Who does it is not important. But what's important is that the case is done right. So I hope that answers this question. And regarding whether orthodontic correction would help in such cases, I don't think so. Because it's skeletal, that is the first thing. Okay. If it is skeletal, uh, it's very difficult to correct this type of a skeletal class 3 occlusion. See, even, 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 uh, even if it has to be corrected orthodontically, see, such cases are not true orthodontic corrections. They become orthognathic cases, in which case the orthodontics is combined with orthognathic surgery, where surgically the mandible is repositioned in the correct uh, you know, uh, uh, in the correct occlusal scheme to give, you know, to uh, convert the patient from a class three to a class one. So this type of case cannot be corrected in traditional chair side orthodontics. In combination with orthodontic surgery, yes, but not traditional orthodontics. Okay. And not all patients are prepared for this. So that's another thing. Not all patients are interested at whatever stage of life they are in. They just simply want to finish their treatment. They came for just one bridge. That's it. That's all they want to do and go. And this is reality. This is reality. So we need to be able to identify the patient's needs also. What does the patient need? See, I have said this in, in the last two webinars. What does the patient want versus what does the patient actually need? This is a question that we need to ask ourselves every single time we come across any case. The patient's wants and the patient's needs are often poles apart. The patient's needs are what we think the patient needs based on textbook textbook idealism. The patient's wants are, are far cry from it because it depends on their finances, depends on the amount of time that they need to invest. So very often clinical practice is a compromise and a mid ground between these two extremes. You know, so these are all the things that we need to uh, we need to keep in mind. So when this patient came back to me after four days, I had to take a call. Okay, based on, on the patient, her mentality, her, uh, her personality. And I could see that she had tried. It's not that she hadn't tried. She had tried. But from what she told me, she, wasn't, she was absolutely not able to eat. She was not able to eat. She was really suffering. And the Enzoflam also was helping, but not much. You know, um, even with the Enzoflam, the pain was pretty severe. And, it, and, you know, as soon as the effect of the Enzoflam wore down, you know, the pain would start again. So I had to take a decision. There was no point in making her suffer uh, for no reason. So four or five days later, I made the decision that we are going to have to compromise in this case, the, the true MIP that I think is the true MIP. She is not able to adapt to it. I cannot 
you know sometimes forcing a patient into ideal occlusion can actually be very cruel you know it's not ideal for that patient at that point and time this is something we have to accept so compromise in clinical practice is inevitable and compromise doesn't always mean that uh, you know the end result is going to be bad or that the end result is going to be wrong it's not like that it's not like that where and how you compromise is what is important so i had to compromise but the compromise doesn't mean that i'm going to fabricate the fpd again once again in the habitual mip and send the patient that is wrong that is not what i mean by compromise what i mean by compromise here is sitting chair side with an articulating paper investing more than an hour of clinical chair side time i'm sitting and removing interferences bilaterally i did it for both sides you have to usually do it for both sides in such cases so i removed the interferences on the right side between the pmma and her opposing uh, upper natural dentition and i also did it on her left side so after the bilateral equilibration with articulating paper we were able to come to some form of consensus that the patient was comfortable with and that is what you are seeing in this picture over here and most patients appreciate the efforts that we are also taking you know you have to give that patient that little extra aid for the tmj to be able to adjust and adapt and once i did this equilibration the patient took another 10 days to adjust but she said that she's getting there you know each day was better than the previous you know that's one of the ways you judge whether you need to do the compromise or not because earlier each day was as bad as the previous or it was probably even worse but here she was getting better and after 15 days she was completely fine she had no problem so when she came to me again after 15 days and i asked her if i asked her to open her mouth or if i asked her to close her mouth she would close in the true mip that i had shown in the earlier slide so this is when you know that you can proceed with the final cap okay this is how you know that the patient has been deprogrammed and uh, you know it is time to give the patient the final prosthesis now how do i um, you know convey this information what i am seeing in the mouth to the lab so if you have a scanner you just scan and and you send this file file to the lab but even then it's not so easy you require an experienced technician with such cases okay so what i did is i made a lower arch impression with the pmma in place i left i i didn't remove i didn't remove the temporary at all the temporary fpd i left it in the mouth and i made a full full arch impression with the pmma okay i took photographs i took a bite with the pmma now i sent this lower cast to the lab so it is very easy for them to now articulate it according to what i am seeing in the mouth and then they, again there are two ways in which the lab could do this one way is uh, they create a whole new exocat okay now this isn't something that i prefer because when the pmma has been made in one exocat you have modified it and then you create a whole new exocat once again there is always a chance of some slight error creeping in somewhere so what what i do in such cases is what i have instructed my lab is when i when i'm giving the lab the lower cast with with this I, you know with, they already have the cast with a prepared tooth you don't need to repeat that since you have given the patient a temporary the margins are safe there is no issue okay what what they are going to do is they have the old exocat where where uh, you know the, the the prepared cast had been uh, you know articulated there is something called superimposition so the lab has to superimpose this occlusion onto that before milling the final not all labs do it not all technicians know how to do it so this is again something um, that you need to inquire from your lab whether they are aware of this concept whether they know how to do it okay and if, even if they know there are technicians who may uh, theoretically know how to do it but do not really know how to do it practically so yeah it's 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 difficult it's tough it's not easy but the second technique is better because it completely eliminates any type of error that can creep in as i said struggle uh, struggle before but not on the day of insertion of the final prosthesis so if you want the day of of the final insertion of the prosthesis to be smooth where there are absolutely no adjustments done to the prosthesis chair side you place the prosthesis in the mouth 
and the and you know everything is perfect you cement and you send the patient then you have to follow this procedure there are no two ways about it any type of shortcut is again going to cause some high pointed interference in the final and i don't believe in um, in adjusting the occlusal surfaces of final of the final prosthesis chair sets especially if it's cat cam because if i have to do that then the entire point of uh, the cat cam uh, is smooth then there is no use in doing a cat cam prosthesis then there would have been no difference between uh, you know a handmade lost wax technique tfm and a and a cat cam and a cat cam and a cat cam uh, you know uh, fpd so uh, the final intercuspation always depends on patient's comfort okay it it's not as per the idealism that 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 uh, exists in literature so what we did was obviously obviously if you see from here this is based on the adjustment of the pmma she was not tight she was not very comfortable with that very very tight intercuspation that i had given her earlier okay in her pmma so as you can see this is the compromise i'm talking about there is intercuspation she is in true mip she is not in habitual mip but she could not tolerate extremely tight intercuspation this she was able to tolerate only this much so we give her that much we give her what she is able to tolerate this is what i mean by compromise and deprogramming is an ongoing process if you want to prevent a relapse what do i mean by that if you have deprogrammed a patient successfully your final prosthesis has to take the place of the trial prosthesis exactly the way the trial prosthesis functioned the final has to function in exactly the same manner so that the deprogramming continues life long and the patient doesn't relapse why do some patients relapse they relapse because of two reasons either after the deprogramming the patient never came back for the final okay and they stop wearing the deprogrammer also at some point this usually happens with external appliances they're not compliant they don't wear it they don't come back and that's the end of it the second the second uh, state the second type of situation where it the relapse takes place is if the final prosthesis doesn't fit fit the mold or the space of the temporary exactly the way the temporary was S even slight mismatch here and there makes a lot of difference the, this is the reason i went to the extent of the superimposition that i spoke about earlier because the programming is an ongoing process and it has to continue life long if you do not want a relapse but if the superimposition had not been done there is a chance that there would have been some minor relapse here and there because the final prosthesis would not have been exactly the same as a temporary so it's like um it's like having you know it's like an old pair of shoes that uh, you know you are you are really, really the patient is really really comfortable with and it's like the patient removes the feet from the shoes for a certain period of time and then puts it back and then when the patient slides his or her feet back in the shoes they feel exactly the same they fit exactly the same and you know they are um, they have the same comfort that they had when they when they wore them last this should be the feeling that the patient has for lack of a better an analogy if the patient does not have this feeling there is every chance that the deprogramming will not be successful and the patient will relapse back so this is the final prosthesis okay as you can see it is not the very very tight intercuspation that i had attempted to give initially with the pmma it's a compromise but that's okay because it's in her true mip and i've managed to maintain the little 0.5 mm of you know overjet that uh, that this uh, that this patient had so how do you judge clinical success for me clinical success is when all the back end struggle um you know before this appointment um took place and was worth my time and effort because on the day of this appointment i simply place the prosthesis i ask the patient to bite and the patient gives me this bite and it's a simply 15 minute appointment that's it no chair side adjustment nothing you know that is clinical success if you can achieve this appointment in the minimum amount of time okay with Uh, absolutely no adjustment of the prosthesis chair side the patient goes home and just continues with life as though nothing has happened because for the patient nothing has happened in the same appointment i have removed the temporary and i have uh, you know cemented the permanent 
So the patient is basically going home with the same feeling as the comfy shoes feeling. Nothing has changed for the patient. So the patient is able to get back to normal life and continue the deprogramming. Then it is clinical success. Okay. Else it's not. Very soon you can expect a relapse. And, uh, you know, sometimes we don't realize how soon the relapse has taken place, mainly because the patient doesn't come back to us soon enough. They come back to us very often years down the line and then you realize how wrong it had all gone. Okay. So deprogramming is permanent and lifelong and it can be achieved only if the occlusion is comfortable for the patient. This last part is very, very, very important in such cases. You have to give the patient occlusion which is comfortable for them. And that sometimes means a little bit of compromise. It is impossible to do such cases without that tiny little bit of compromise chair side. Also, documentation is very, very important in such cases. The success or the failure of the prosthesis depends upon it because this, the contrast between these two images clearly shows us how very, very uh, identical, you know, the occlusion is. This is the true MIP without any prosthesis in the mouth. This is the true MIP with the final prosthesis in the mouth. And they're identical. Okay. If you do not have this earlier documentation, you have nothing to compare it with. So this documentation is very important. It's also very important in such cases because you need to have this documentation to know how you send the patient versus how they come back to you in the future, if and when they have any issues. And they may or they may not because, you know, this loss of wear is something that you need to wait and watch. And as Hippocrates says, you cure sometimes, you treat often, but comfort always, you know, because when patients go back home, this is what they want to do, relax and get back to their normal life. Their dental treatment is over. They do not want any pain, any discomfort or any extra dental visits for whatever may be the reason. And it's our duty to be able to um, give them this. And with that, I end my uh, webinar for uh, today. You can get in touch with me. Uh, I'm there on Insta. I'm there on, this is my Insta handle. This is my Facebook page. This is my Facebook profile. Feel free to reach out to me and uh, get in touch. And uh, I'm sh stopping my screen share now. Uh, Dr. Urvashi, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, doctor. Can, can we see you? We've not been able to see you entire, <laughs> through the entire session. Yeah, it, co it costs yeah. bandwidth. Okay, so I think my screen, it's as well. You're frozen? Yeah, it kind of looks... It's frozen, yeah, right? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, um, see, if it works out, it works out because I don't know. See, it's not loading back now. I had switched it off to conserve the bandwidth when I was presenting and now I have turned it okay. back on and it's still not turning back on. So I think that's luck or I don't know. No, it's got hung actually. I can't do anything about it. Okay. Okay. No issues, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for such an amazing and enlightening session that we had today. We delve deeper into the intricacies of occlusion and what true MIP really is. Where and how we compromise is actually more important than anything else is what I took back from this session. How and when to use deprogrammers and what kind also. We also learned how important documentation is in such cases to establish baseline and to also evaluate how the treatment is progressing. And ultimately, it is the patient's comfort above all that we desire. But I do have a few questions for you, Dr. Deepa. If you're still here, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. So, so there's one question that if in an ideal orthodontic patient, and he doesn't want to undergo orthodontic treatment due to time restraint, then will this kind of treatment justify? was the was one of the questions um see um first of all you know if the patient is a case of ideal orthodontic treatment they would not be a skeletal malocclusion okay that's the first thing and when they are not a case of skeletal malocclusion you don't see this type of complete lack of anterior guidance so this is a very extreme case the cases i have presented in this clinical series are all extreme examples because see routine cases we all get in our practice there's nothing great about a routine case there's nothing special about it. There's nothing interesting. We all know how to handle them. It's these cases which come along. And, you know, these, these cases are not that rare. Huh? 
I mean, if you start keeping an eye out, you will start noticing that, you know, you at least get a couple of these cases every month. But most people aren't able to identify them. So if you can't identify them, that is different, but they do exist. So, you know, two, three cases a month is not that rare. That's the first thing. So if it's an ideal orthodontic case, you're not going to have this presentation in the first place. Okay. Second of all, the patient already came with a pre-existing FPD. See, these are things you need to take into concern. The patient just wants a replacement of the FPD and she needed an endo on that 4-7, which was done. So in such situations, the patient may not be interested in, um, how do I put it, in ortho or anything. They may not be interested. They just want replacement of that one thing that they want to get on with their life. Is the patient completely wrong? No. See, the patient uh, actually needed an extraction of 4-6. I don't know why the 4-6 was extracted. See, all of this was done before the patient came to me. Okay. Why an implant was not placed? Why an FPD was given to the patient? These are not questions I can answer. It would not be the right place for me to answer these questions. You know, I, I don't know what went on between the patient and the earlier clinician. So uh, the ship has sailed for certain patients due to various reasons. And um, I'm not saying ortho is wrong. It's not. Of course, if you can correct, if you can correct a patient's occlusion orthodontically, great. But orthodontic treatment requires a lot of investment on the patient side, both financially as well as with time. So patients are in different stages during different parts of their life. Okay. At a certain stage in their life, they could be busy with their career or their work. They may have the money, but they do not have the time. Not every patient is a case for aligners that, you know, that they can just take home a set of aligners and, you know, keep popping the aligners, uh, uh, aligner sets. And even that does not come without its own fair share of flaws. Huh? That, you know, we, we, you know, that's a topic for another day, but it, it's, it's not that simple either. So uh, then there are the patients who are worried about the finances also because they have ongoing so many other expenses. They don't want to spend for this. So we must respect that. See, as a clinician, we have to be able to give the patient the right bite. I believe in this. Now, whether you do it orthodontically or whether you do it prosthodontically, it doesn't matter. Whether you do it or you call someone else, doesn't matter. Give the patient the bite that is right for that patient. So, um, Dr. Urushi, I'll do one thing. I'll just try to refresh my page. I'll be back in a second because the video is bothering me. Just one minute. Huh? All right, all right. Yeah, uh, just one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One second, one second. Yeah. Okay, much better. Yeah. Yeah, so the, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, there is one another question uh, asked by Dr. Amit. And he's asking, is the TMJ deprogrammer splint like night guard uh, help in muscle relaxation? Yeah, they do. They do. Um, I would honestly, uh, you know, we, let, let's post the link of the deprogramming article before this webinar ends. Okay. Yeah. So I have actually, I, written, I, I, I have actually written an article on deprogrammers with dental reach. And I have mentioned three separate cases. One case was the case I discussed last time. One case is the case I discussed today. The third case is the case that I will be discussing next time. So uh, the case that I discussed last time, the case of smile rehab, okay, uh, where there was no anterior guidance and I had to create one and it was a shallow anterior guidance. Now that patient did not get deprogrammed with the temporary or even with the permanent. I had to give a soft splint to that patient. So there are certain patients for whom an extra appliance like a soft splint is needed, but it's a smaller percentage. It's a smaller percentage, very, very less hardly two, three percent. Most of them get deprogrammed this way. The ones who do not get deprogrammed in that manner are usually those who have a very shallow anterior guidance. Okay. So, but yes, it can be given, but, um, when you have given the patient the right occlusion and then you give a soft splint, it makes sense, but one cannot give a soft splint to the patient in the wrong occlusion and expect it to help. It won't. Because it is one step forward and then one step backward. The patient wears a splint in the night, gets deprogrammed, wakes up next day morning, bites in the wrong bite and goes back to the same old problem again. 
and then beyond the point the soft splint will also stop working because the patient would probably start grinding on that too in the night so or they'll remove it and then stop wearing it beyond the see they're not going to be compliant more than a month no no patient is going to wear the soft splint for a very very long period of time and it's not recommended also okay they're not supposed to wear it day and night they're supposed to wear it only at night but they are not very compliant with it long term they are compliant with it short term but not long term so when they realize that there is no great significant effect and that is because their bite has not been corrected they stop wearing that too but if you correct the bite and to give them the soft splint for an extended limited period of time to just aid in the deprogramming then that gives you very very good stable results long term and that is what we want because otherwise it's going to relapse okay so any other also ma'am uh, uh, do you remember i asked you a question in the middle of the session where an individual was asking that if they can do fmr cases on their own at their clinic so the same individual has also now asked that they want to really learn and start doing fmr cases so from where can they start the next Which webinar sort of suggest <laughs> yes the next webinar yes. the next yes. webinar is on fmr and i would really yes. encourage all those who are interested in fmr see um how you know how you begin with fmr okay is identification you you begin you start your fmr practice in the clinic by being able to identify fmr cases first you have you know so many categories of fmr cases you have the downright fmr case you have potential fmr cases you have case you know you have cases which are going to turn into fmr probably a few years from now like you know this 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 lady over here i don't know she may she may when she's 50 55 when she came to me she was only 28 but you never know the years take a toll right so you don't know so maybe so that's that's a maybe or a potential case you know it's something you mark in your file and you keep but you have to be able to identify cases you have to be able to identify cases in your practice because who you call is a moot point whether you do it by yourself or you don't do, do it by yourself the question doesn't arise if you cannot identify the case that is the first thing okay second of all i've heard this a lot from a lot of people uh, we can't convince fmr cases i've heard this a lot so um i think we should stop using the word convince okay because you can't really convince somebody to do something that they don't want to do you can't you can't force people it is anything that we do is a joint responsibility between us and the patient you can explain to the patient in great detail so you, you know for for the clinical practitioner to be able to sit down with the patient and explain there are two things that are needed one is significant investment of chair side time it may go even up to an hour it's not a consultation you can finish in 10 minutes and the clinician him or herself should be well versed with the topic at least to answer all the basic queries of the patient irrespective of whether he or she is going to do the case or not so you need to sit down with the patient and explain in great detail what they can expect from the treatment why it is needed what are, what are the uh, problems if he or she does not do the treatment okay there are so many things and patients have to understand in long term treatments like fmr that they need to devote a lot of time for the treatment see fmr treatments go on for 2 months 3 months you know there are repeat appointments and the patient has to keep coming back for it's not only the financial part a financial is one part of it yes of course but that's not the only thing if if this consultation is not done right if this explaining is not done right so like there are sometimes you know where the patient comes for the first or second appointment but then vanishes after that that's because they were not completely mentally prepared for what the treatment actually entails they didn't realize the amount of investment and how major a treatment it actually is so they weren't mentally prepared and if they aren't mentally prepared somewhere that the initial consultation has gone grossly wrong you know so because it becomes like a converted patient becoming deconverted and that's not good for the practice that's not good so who does it is not important who who does it is not important the patient going through with the treatment is important identifying the patient is important and 
the patient being comfortable is most important these three things if are, if they are taken care of one can have you know successful fmrs in their practice all right um, thank you dr deepa for uh, clearing the doubts of all the attendees here so with the closing of another amazing session i would like to thank our sponsor group pharmaceutical for helping us conduct this webinar and we will all see you again sooner than later with the next session which is the most exciting uh, session of the series where we will be discussing about fmr in detail and a recording of this webinar will be available shortly so stay tuned and if any of you have missed out they can go and watch the recording the replay will be available for a period of one week till then happy reading all of you and if, and if any and if anyone if anyone wants to watch a replay of the webinar see i understand that these are tough topics okay and it's not possible to absorb so much uh you know uh, just by hearing it once there may be parts that are, that a viewer may want to watch again and when uh, when they do that if if you have any additional doubts or any additional queries please feel free to reach out to me on uh, you know on facebook or insta and i'll be happy to respond all right thank you dr deepa for offering that to our attendees thank you see you bye bye bye